Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. So these sessions are very informal and I am recording the session, but it's very informal. We always do a tool demo and then we spend a lot of time just chatting afterward. Usually there are lots of AI enthusiasts here. And so we we just, we have a lot to talk about. Typically there's no shortage of, of happy discussion. The platform that we build our tools on is called Mind Studio. And we have access to multiple different large language models. And so you might hear us using the, the acronym LLM. We use that one a lot. So large language models. ChatGPT is one of the most famous large language models. GPT-4 is my favorite one currently. I think it's the best one that's out there. But a good a uh, analogy that I just read like earlier this week on LinkedIn was um, it's so a language model is kind of like a tissue. Chat GBT is like a brand name, like Kleenex. So <laughs> if that helps you to understand kind of what we're talking about, large language models are the neural networks that we are using to sort of fuel these tools. And we mostly use GPT-4 and we just got access through Mind Studio to GPT-4 Turbo, which is just a faster, it's their most advanced version, it has a huge context window. And so the, the reason we created this tool is because we have lots of Navigator members. Navigator tier of membership is for with graduate students. It's relatively inexpensive monthly, it's nine bucks a month. So it's half the cost of GPT-4. And essentially, if all the tools are using GPT-4, you're, you're getting access to GPT-4 for kind of half that price. And at this point, even if you sign up for the $20 a month GPT-4 subscription, which again, is not related to our, our company, you still wouldn't be able to get access to, to Turbo right now because they have that kind of moratorium on letting new people use the plus upgrade. So we're really excited about this. So essentially this AI assistant is just your access to GPT-4 on our platform. That's really all it is. Now it does give you the option of uploading a file. So because it is basically just you interacting with GPT-4, I want to talk a little bit about prompt engineering because most of our tools, you don't have to do the prompt engineering. That's the beauty of them. We do that for you. On the back end, you never even see the prompt. We just give you kind of a, a question to start with, or we say, you know, tell me what you want to do. And so you're not having to interact with it because prompt engineering is not rocket science. But it's also, especially for really busy grad students, it's another thing to learn. So we're really trying to kind of help you offload some of that cognitive heaviness that comes with being a graduate student. Okay, so that said, let me just say, there's, I think the easiest three things to know about prompt engineering, there's a lot, there's a whole lot, but just let's just start very, very small. Is just role. So that means you need to give the machine a role. For example, you are an editor of a high impact academic journal, and I am going to give you a draft of my article. And so I'm giving the machine a role and I'm giving me as a user a role, a label, so that the bot has a sense of where I'm coming from, right? So I'm giving the machine a role and I'm, and I'm labeling my own role, okay? And then I give it a task, provide feedback on this draft of my manuscript. And then I might say it's in this discipline or this sub or I might give it a hint. But, but honestly, if I'm giving it a draft of my manuscript, it's going to see and read through that methodology, for example, or it's going to see what discipline I'm in by reading it. So you don't have to give it a lot, but just give it that verb. So I'm a linguist. So I really like to focus in on the specifics of the language. So give it a verb. Do you want evaluation? Do you want criticism? Do you want like harsh feedback or do you want it to be a little gentle? And you can give it some kind of a little bit of emotional rhetoric because you know yourself, right? It's going to be nice to you no matter what. I mean, that's the beauty of these things that they're trained to be very nice. And honestly, I think that is one thing about using it for writing feedback is that if you're getting writing feedback from a tutor or coach or human, any kind of human, you know, humans get tired of, you know, there's, there, we say there's like no dumb questions, like if you're a teacher, but 
humans are inherently we're, we're human. And so after the 10th time someone may ask us something or give us something to look at, we're going to be tired of looking at it, but the machine will not get tired. So it's going to be nice to you. It's going to be encouraging to you, but you can tell it, you know, this is a really rough draft or this draft is almost ready to go. And I need you to be extremely critical because it's very important that this get, I don't, I want to reduce the number of revisions that I'm asked to make or something like that. And then finally, you you want to tell it what kind of output. So the output can be, I mean, it's just going to give you text unless you tell, I, I mean, it's just going to give you paragraphs of text unless you tell it something else, like give me b- bullet points, make an outline. It, I do a lot of tables. If you're using our tools, you'll notice that we love to use tables, feedback tables, where it's giving you like a criteria a status update. Are you meeting that criteria? You'll see a little green check. If you're not meeting that criteria, you'll see a red exclamation point and then an explanation and often a quote from your writing. So you can tell it that. You can say, generate the feedback in a matrix or a table. And you don't have to give it like, what's column one going to be or column two? It's GPT-4. It will figure that out. And then if you don't like what it gives you, iterate the prompt again right? So it's very much iterative. It's negotiating meaning with that machine. And actually, this is how humans learn language. This is the beauty of of a large language model is that we naturally, when we're learning a language, either a first language as a child or a second language anytime in our life, we do that by getting something we don't want from the interlocutor and then iterating it, changing what we to say, here's what I actually need and negotiating that interaction with the other thing, whether it's a human or now we have this ability to do it with a bot. So that meaning negotiation is really where the learning takes place. And so that's not a bad thing. So don't be afraid to just tell it. Yeah, that wasn't what I'm looking for. Let's go back. Let's try the table again. Let's do this other thing with the table. But it doesn't have to be a table. It could be, you know, just a bulleted list or it could be nothing. You know, it could just, you could just say, just give me concise output or give me as much output as you possibly can. You know, whatever you're looking for, ask for it. So roll task output. Normally you won't need this, but with this particular tool in our suite, you will. Okay. So this is what um, the tool looks like. It's available at Navigator and above. But basically, this is just a general purpose tool. You can use it for whatever you want. You, you don't even need to be using it for academic stuff. If you, I mean, if you, if you don't want to, it can do anything. But it's going to be better at academics kinds of tasks because basically, this is what we told it. We, we told it on the back end, you are an AI assistant that is being used by academics or graduate students or, or, or whatever. Some things you can do with it are you can review, summarize, and analyze files. So if you're familiar with Chat PDF, I don't know if you've heard of that program. Chat PDF was a really early kind of API from, it doesn't come from OpenAI, but it allowed you to upload a PDF and then it would give you a summary. You could ask it questions. So This tool can take a PDF and it can summarize it for you. You can query the PDF. I'm going to give you a use case in just a minute that I was just using it for because chat PDF, you can only upload two files a day. Well, if you're writing a dissertation, I I can tell you that is not enough. (laughs) Two PDFs a day is not enough. So rather than paying for chat PDF, if you already have a subscription to us at at least the navigator level, you you get this tool as part of the suite. So it can, it can answer your questions. It doesn't matter how obscure or complex it is. These large language models, especially GPT-4 Turbo, they have a, they have so much data on the back end. It, it's a very specific kind of tool that you can, it's, it's familiar with lots of different disciplines. And so you can ask it about methodology. You can ask it about analysis theoretical frameworks, is familiar with so many things that you might not know. And you can engage it in conversation. So if it gives you some output and then you didn't quite like the output, like I said, you can you can clarify. You can ask it another question. Or let's say you understood everything but a couple of items in the output. You can clarify by saying, tell me more about or 
help me understand and then kind of prompt it to interact with it. And it, like I said, negotiate with it to get what you want. And then finally, you know, you can, you can get feedback. Now, most of our other tools are designed to give you feedback, but if you don't want to use a specific tool, if you just want a generic tool, this is your go-to. That said, if you don't want to upload a file, you don't have to. It's still just a chat bot. I'll show you and I'll walk you through the interface of it because it does immediately ask you for a file. But as you'll learn with all of our tools, if it's asking you for something and that's not how you want to use the tool, like let's say it's asking you for research questions and you're not quite ready with your research questions, you want to use the tool to brainstorm research questions. Then you just tell the tool, I don't have my research questions. I'm working on them. Here's the topic and it will help you to walk through that process. Same with this tool. It's going to ask you for a file, but if you don't want to upload a file, you can just click next and skip that and then interact with it just like it's a chat bot. I'm going to show you what it looks like when you originally get to our website. So this is the homepage of our website. And if you want to log into your account, once you have established your username and password, you click account and it will give you a login screen. And next you're gonna see this side panel pop up. So for me, I have access to all three tiers, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start here with Navigator today because that's the minimum that you need to access this specific tool. I'm gonna to go to the main menu. So let me say one thing about this. When you go to the account page, you're going to see your, whatever is your level of membership. So if you started as an explorer and then you upgraded to navigator, you'll see both of those. If you upgrade to pioneer, you will, like me, see all three. But the way that you access everything is here underneath its pages. So that is where the tools are located is under your account and then under your tier of membership and then pages. Okay. So down here under Navigator Tools, you'll see the feature tools, the AI Assistant. It, it says try the Assistant. I'm going to click try it. And it comes up. And I already showed you a screenshot of this. Now, what you see here is my previous ex interactions with the tool. So we can't see your interactions with the tool. And, and obviously you can't see ours, but your interactions are saved in the tool until you clear your cache or, or delete your cookies. But, you know, if you're not doing anything like that with your, with your system, they will stay there just like they do in GPT, where you have on the side there, that list of your chat history. So here's how I was using the tool today. Jessica and I were working on a manuscript. I was needing to get some quick insight into a, a, a a methodology that I'm not familiar with. And so she sent me a file. And of course, ideally, we would read everything very carefully, right? And if it's something that's really central to our expertise, like for my dissertation, when I was reading about the methodology section of my dissertation, I had to read everything much, much more carefully. But for this, I just needed to get a general idea of this particular methodology. And I needed to get, I was, what I was trying to do was write a definition. So I was going back to like a seminal publication about this methodology type to try to get an understanding so that I could write a definition for our manuscript. This is the home screen that you come to if you've never used the tool before. It introduces itself to you. It asks you to click next, and then you get to the upload file. So if you wanted to upload a file, you would click on this little button here. I'm going to go into my downloads. Here is the file that I was trying to read really quickly. I'm going to open it. Now, at this point, if you don't have a file that you want to upload, this button here says next, and you could just click that. So help me get a good definition of action learning. That's what I was trying to do. Click next. And now it's going to work. Essentially, it's going to work just like chat PDF would work, where it's going to take all the pieces in the document and vector them out, and separate those sentences. And it will start working on summarizing 
what I ask it to do. Now it can do a general summary or it can like scan and locate or seek information because, you know, journal articles are long. They're 30 ish pages. And so you would have to do some extra reading. So it saves you quite a bit of time. And so now what it's doing is it's going through that PDF and it's just finding the key components of this particular type of, for us, we're using it as a research methodology and it's giving me kind of like the top six key components. Now I can take that and I can help form my own definition of it. So that is what the tool does. And then let's say I wanted to find out about more about number four. Tell me more about number four. And it can just give me a little bit more information. It's going to dig a little deeper in the tool. It even tells me, oh, I think it's it thought I was asking about section four and not number four. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm not quite getting what I asked it for. So this isn't a perfect example of that. Like it's going to give me, I mean, this is really good information, but this isn't exactly what I was looking for. So I'm going to just iteratively prompt it again. I'm going to wait till it finishes <laughs> and it might go on for a little bit here. So this time to be more specific, I'm going to go back up and I'm going to grab that number four. This is really what I was looking for this number four. So I'm going to copy that and say, I meant this number four, and I'm going to paste it. Just like I would talk to a human. I'm going to give it the minimum amount of context I need to interact with it to get what I want out of the negotiation. So now it's giving me more of what I want and it it's going to just scroll. It's not going to stay still until it's finished outputting all that text. So I'll wait until it's done. But that's basically the tool. PDF, Excel, Word document, any of those files can be uploaded and queried basically. Or you can just use it as a generic chatbot and start with whatever you want to start with, whatever you're working on. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now and open it up for any questions or comments that you might have about this tool, about our other tools. This is an open forum. So feel free to just jump in with whatever you want to chat about. Okay, here it is, Lit Synthesis Men Mentor. So I'm going to click on this. So this tool provides targeted feedback on a literature synthesis and evaluates the a, some criteria in your writing, such as the quality of your sources, the depth of your engagement with those sources, your structure and coherence, your original contribution. So one thing students, graduate students struggle with in the beginning is understanding the difference between like an annotated bibliography kind of function versus a synthesis lit review function, the consistency of your citation, the community of goals, et cetera. So again, these are, this is what the last time I use the tool gives you some feedback. I'm going to click new and it says, hello, I'm an AI powered writing tutor. I'm going to evaluate your paper and provide you feedback on how well you synthesize literature. I will click next. I'm just going to upload that same file because I don't have just a standalone lit review ready to go, or actually maybe I'll use, let's see if I can find a recent manuscript that I wrote. Okay, so here we go. So I'm just going to let it work. While it's working, coming back to the chat, Jenny had asked if it can output an Excel file. I think it can output an Excel file. Yeah, chat. Oh yeah, it can. It can to download mm -hmm. or it'll just output a table. It down, it can, yeah, I think so. Then so we so we may be able to. We need, this is a good question, Jenny. I'll have to investigate. It can definitely output like a CSV kind of format, but I don't know if it, I'm almost positive GPT-4 can. So if GPT-4 can, then our, then this tool can, because it uses GPT-4. So here's the checklist. And again, on the back end of this, we've prompted it to use this checklist and apply it to whatever is uploaded. So I uploaded uh, a manuscript that I wrote. It's telling me my topic sentences look good. Multiple sources per paragraph. It says some paragraphs could benefit from including more than one source to enhance the synthesis of literature. So that's something I need to look at. Let me go back. 
where, okay, yes, relevant findings. It says the writer discussed, discusses relevant findings and does not get bogged down in unnecessary details. So what I would do if I were you, I mean, the goal here is like efficiency, right? So green generally means you're fine in that category, okay? So as a student, you may want to read it because if you're a graduate student, chances are at some point you're going to be giving somebody else feedback on their writing, either as a peer reviewer in a class or as a peer reviewer for a journal or as a professor who is teaching. So learning how to give good feedback is part of the process of using these tools. So if, if you're in a big hurry, I would say, look at least at the red exclamation points. Those are, those are trying to get your attention. They're kind of like red flags. If you're wanting to really learn and dig deep at where you're writing, maybe you're looking for patterns in your writing that you want to eliminate and get better over time, you know, you might want to read through these. But if you're in a hurry, I would at least go to the ones where you have the red exclamation point. So here it says the writer could improve on discussing similarities or differences between sources rather than summarizing each source in turn. So this is really great feedback for me. I'm about to send this out to a, a journal and I, I need to do a final edit. It. And so now I know exactly where to start. So Keith, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were looking for. But that's what we have available. And then there are lots of other tools that do this too. So I will send you the tube link to that tutorial that Jessica does 10 minutes. And it just kind of walks you through a, a, a workflow. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to see that. Yeah. I'm going to stop oh. sharing so I can see. Oh, my apologies. So I yeah. have a question. First, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really grateful that we do live in the age of AI, where we can incorporate our own intelligence and have artificial intelligence help us. So shout out to that. My first question is, you mentioned Sight. Does academic, does insight, does academic Insight offer that feature where you incorporate, where I would mention something incorporates into an article? No, not yet. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. No. Okay. Um... Oh, go ahead. We're in touch with them though. Please, <laughs> really like please. My but, second question, um, oh, go ahead, my apologies. No, no, you go ahead. My second question is, and if if the, if someone already knows the answer, feel free to jump in. I'm just curious. When it comes to producing work as a researcher, what are the safety measures regarding when we put up work? So for example, if I'm, I, you know, this is some research no one knows, but I'm generating a new theory, nobody knows. And then I put it into one of these AI port, these AR portals. What are the safety measures? Like, is does it go on an individual server? Does someone else have access to it? If it gets leaked, am I allowed to take legal action? Do I have to have, does it have to be copywritten? What are, what are the protections around it? I only ask because I've had a couple of friends in academia, particularly grad students, who are writing their dissertations and freaked out when I said, oh, pop in your problem statement, pop in this. And she said, no, my, my chair said they can find out and that they'll know. And I'm like, well, who's they? Who are these people that are going to know that you utilize the tool? So I guess it's more so from a standpoint of academic integrity, but then also just making sure that I'm protecting my work and no one else is going to get credit for my work and being able to utilize it to fidelity where it is beneficial for me as a researcher. Okay, so I just want to re what I heard you say. You have two parts to your question. One is a generic question about academic integrity and the use of AI tools as a kind of assistant when you're writing. And then the second question is more of a privacy question related to how your data is stored or not stored. Okay, so... I'm going to answer the first the the privacy question first, and then I'll move on to the ethical potential ethical murkiness. Um, we don't store any of your data. It is it is private to you. My understanding is that because you do have the chat history on on the side there, your data could be used to, to train the model. Is that right? No, no, it's not used to train the model. It's not used to train the model, but the chat history is on. Only when they're still, when their IP address is still connected to that browsing session, 
it keeps their chat history for them. But, but it's not they, using to train the model. No. Okay. No. Okay. Did you all hear that? Sorry. We had a, we just had a meeting with them and I, I guess I misunderstood. We clarified this issue of privacy because of course it's an issue for academics are really concerned. They're generating, you know, highly sensitive stuff. It's, it's proprietary to them. They are understandably concerned that it stays private. And so, yeah, it, that history is available to you, but it isn't being used to train the model and we can't see it. Nobody else yeah. can see it. Our other users, nobody can see it, but you, but it's still there for you. Yeah. From a technical perspective, what we know from the engineers is that all of these AI companies that have an application layer on top of chat GPT or any other large language model is called an API integration. And so they don't have the ability to store chat history like chat, like open AI's chat GPT does because of the nature of the API integration. Okay. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to follow on that before I tackle academic integrity? Okay. So all this technology is new, right? And people, the world is kind of reeling, especially higher ed. Nobody quite knows what to make of it. So I can give you a high level overview of best practices. We try to have our hands really in it all the time in terms of looking at what the literature is saying about these, these things and, and following people on LinkedIn who are thought leaders and giving our own opinions about what we think are best practices. And I will tell you that it's changed even just in the little over, what, 13 months since ChatGPT has been publicly available, it has changed. So APA has rules. If you're using APA, they have really clear rules on their blog. It's not in the APA 7 manual because that, you know, it's already printed, but they have a great blog and they have really specific, clear instructions about how to treat a large language model in your academic writing. In terms of the question of like how much is too much, we like to use the concept of an, an AI sandwich. This is what we call it. We call it an AI sandwich. So you might start your process using AI to help you ideate, generate ideas, brainstorm, kind of get you started in the process. I don't know about you, but that's the hardest part usually is just the getting started. And then once you get started, the middle section, this is why we call it the, the sandwich, the middle section is you doing the writing on your own. So whether you're using our tools or whether you're using Claude or Elicit or Slide or any of those tools, do a little work and then take a break and do some writing on your own. Get your own ideas out there. And then at the end, you may follow up to kind of close the gap on your argumentation, your thinking, any questions you still might have. So that's the kind of the bottom piece of the sandwich, right? So in the middle is the human. And that's also a way to think about the human in the loop. Um, you may have heard that if you're following AI very closely, keeping the human in the loop. So I think if you're following that as an academic, that is just a standard procedure to keep you out of the weeds. In terms of taking text that has been generated by a model and putting it into your document, you know, that is certainly something you can do. What I do is I take the text and then I make it my own. Our tools, however, don't do that much generating for you. And if you ask them to do a whole lot of generating for you, well, now that chatbot that I just showed you is a chatbot. So it's going to just generate for you. But if you're using a tool like your purpose statement tool, where you know, you're know you refining a purpose statement, if you ask that tool to write a purpose statement for you, it's going to say, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm a chatbot coach and I will explain to you what a good purpose statement looks like and I will coach you through the process of writing one, but it is not my job to write it for you. So we have these guardrails in place and we red team the tools. Red teaming is a term that means we 
we test them, we poke them, we try to get them to do things that we don't want them to do so that we can iteratively prompt engineer the back end to stop that from happening. Because graduate students don't want to be tempted with a bunch of generated text that they may or may not have expected was coming because it looks good, it sounds good, and it may even be good. But the question remains, is this ethical to use it? So there are a lot of questions about that. Now, if if you're using it, let's say you're following the sandwich protocol and you've you've used it to generate some ideas, you've written it yourself, and then you're following up at that bottom piece of the puzzle with with kind of confirming or correcting what you've written with the a with the AI, then at that point it would be the same to me as if you were doing something like using Grammarly or if you hired an editor to go in and, or even just asked a friend, hey, I wrote this course paper, can you glance at it? Or, you know, a colleague at work, I'm working on this manuscript, can you read through this methodology section and tell me if it's clear? I mean, to me that it's, it's, it's really no different. If your colleague shared with you a really impactful sentence, wrote it on the side of your paper, put it in a comment, that's, you know, I mean, you you could ask them, hey, that sentence was great. I love that sentence. Could I, could I use that? But you can't, you can't ask an AI that. So then you have to decide, am I going to use that sentence or not? Usually I, I'm going to change at least something in the sentence. That's going to lead me to this, my final point about this, which is the issue of detection, which is being talked about a lot. So there are no good detectors. Detectors don't work. And what we know about detectors is that they tend to target non-native English speakers. So professors, teachers who are using detectors to try to catch students, you know, illegally using large language models are, are getting into very, very murky territory because, you know, when you wrongly accuse somebody of something as, as dire as, as that, it's, you know, that's, that's a lot. That's a, that's a really big deal. So they're, they're not accurate. You, you can test them. I encourage you to test them so that you can talk about this with your colleagues and your own network. And if you're teaching, certainly to share this with your students, generate some text and put it in something like GPT-0, which is a freely available generative text uh, detection and see what it tells you. And then take something that you wrote that you know that you 100% wrote yourself and put it in there and see what it gives you. And then maybe mix it a little bit and see. And just, it's so inaccurate. I have done it with fully generated text that I wrote two years ago when I there was no such thing as a large language model. And it'll give me something like 87% likely to be written by a language model. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And then sometimes I'll give it something like I was working with a colleague and we were actually getting ready to send a manuscript off. And she had had the manuscript for the final. And I said, Hey, I'm going to run it through GPT zero just to see what it says, because we were using, we were co-working with it the whole time. And she said, Oh yeah, put the abstract in because I generated the full abstract by putting in the paper and having it generate the abstract because she wrote the paper. So to me, that's, that doesn't cross an ethical line. For me, that doesn't, because if you generated the ideas and the machine is just summarizing it for you, that doesn't cross an ethical line, but everybody has a different threshold with that. And I put the abstract in and it said like 20% likely to be generated. And we knew that the whole thing had been generated. So it's just wildly unpredictable and unreliable. That's what we know about them right now. What would you like to follow up on with that? That was a lot. No, it was, it was really, really beneficial because I think what's occurring is when you have people who who have gotten their PhDs or been in academia, you know, in the genesis, like prior before, like back when people were still using encyclopedias, which I love encyclopedias, but you have, you know, us millennials and you have other generations coming in and it's like, well, oh, you're not really a researcher, you're not a scientist. And it's like, well... It's it's like but when computers first came out and people were still using typewriters, does that mean that I'm not actually, you know, am I not IT? Am I not this person? And I thank you for just providing that framework around it. It's 
it's I'm learning it's like fire. You can either cook the food or you can cook a person. You can burn down the house or you can warm your house. So <laughs> yeah, it's what right. what are you gonna do with it? And I think <laughs> we're not gonna know. I have a seven year old and my son, when he was three, mind you, don't know where he got it from. He said he was going to Yale. He's been saying that since he was three. He'll he's seven. And I think we won't really know what AI is going to do until he gets into higher ed. And then then we'll say, oh, because for all we know, he might say, Mom, I'm not writing papers. Such and such is going to do that for me. And I'm like, what? Where's mm -hmm. this degree coming from? But it's beneficial. And you definitely answer my questions, especially regarding the security part, because I've had a lot of other, you know, people who are not, who've been in academia for quite some time, tenured, you know, veteran individuals who are curious about it, but are fearful because mm -hmm. someone has either, you know, oh, you better not put that in there. They're going to know, or they're afraid someone is going to take their stuff, you know, things of that nature. So this is really, really insightful. Thank you so much. Ah, what other questions do you have? This hey. is Jeremiah. Uh, I have a quick question. I know I've used the theoretical mentor before. Do you have something like that does the theoretical analysis? So if I'm, if I really want to kind of see how my my framework or my theory that section is do you have something that specifically analyzes the theoretical framework and you have used the theoretical framework mentor are you asking for are you yes. asking so, if that tool can do this or if you are are you asking if we have a different tool yeah well both what i what i've gotten from the theoretical framework mentor is it suggests frameworks it, it suggests theoretical frameworks. Like so, based on your research question, based on your purpose statement, it it, it says these are some theories that would be good for you. You can use liberation theology. You can use this, but it's it's less of analysis of what you already have. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Let me pull up that tool that you're asking about. The synthesis. No. 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 The theoretical. Framework mentor. I'm just going to quickly. It's under the uh, introduction chapter. Okay. So it is under pioneer, under introduction chapter. It's here. So it says get help identifying an appropriate theory and constructing a theoretical framework. I'm going to scroll down. It starts by asking you what are the key concepts or variables in your research. So Jeremiah, walk me through this. What are the key concepts or variables in your research? Yeah, liberation theology, black theology, uh, race and racism, I guess. That's enough. That's plenty. I'm going to click next. Briefly describe your study participants. I believe your participants are text. Yeah, your yeah, text. Yeah? Yep, that's right. Okay. And so, of course, it's going to talk you, it's going to start with CRT, and then it's going to give you lots of other ideas, I, I assume. Now, your question was, what can you do just beyond like brainstorming or ide ideation of what possibilities there are? Is that right? Yeah. So I, I'm thinking of a tool more like a reviewer or refiner. So, mm -hmm. you know, have you have this purpose statement, reviewer, research question, refiner. Mm -hmm. They're taking what you already have written and refining, reviewing. What would you That's like? That's kind of what I was hoping for. So if 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 I if I were the tool and you were just talking to me about it, let's just imagine I'm a I'm a robot and you're just talking to me. What would you say, Kim? I want you to. I want you to review this theoretical framework section for for clarity. Oh. And. Okay, that then I would go. I would just use. I, I know you joined us late, and I don't remember exactly what point you joined, but I was going over this. AI assistant that we are featuring right now. And so I would actually put it in here that I would use this tool for that purpose, where you take the section and you upload it. And then the tool will say like, basically, what do you want to know about this thing that you uploaded? And then you can question it, like, you know, help me think critically through this theoretical framework as it applies to my research. So, and the reason why I asked about that theoretical framework mentor section, I didn't know if you, I didn't know what was on the back end feeding it. So mm -hmm. I didn't know if you had examples of texts from, you know, 
theoretical framework sections or I didn't know what was feeding that to if, if that does that make sense? I think there's any data source on the back end of that one because it would just it would have to be I don't even know uh, how that would yeah that's a great okay. idea right. we had if we had a some sort of broad resource that could could do that we we would definitely we could definitely add it on the back end but we don't have anything that broad because we work with people from social sciences life sciences right. humanities you know stem it would it would have to be such a broad. So what I'll say is that whatever is in the black box of data that OpenAI has, that is they use to train these models, that is robust enough to interact with you about these, these kinds of questions. Okay. One is on the, I'm on here now. The assistant is on the homepage. The assistant is on the main menu page. So if you're in your Pioneer membership, I know you are a Pioneer, you, you click on that and you can go to it. And, and Navigator, if you're Navigator. It's it's not available for free, but if you upgrade it, at least Navigator. Actually, I we have another meeting starting right now. So if you have any other follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer them. You have my email. It's Kimberly at academicinsightlab.org and just send me your questions and I'll be happy to kind of continue answering anything that you may want to talk about. Hi, Thank Brandy. You. We started at two. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. You, Hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.